God of communion, you called prophets as your mouthpiece and sent apostles to spread the gospel message. We pray for our young people that they may become your new prophets and apostles, especially in the use of the social media as they continue to adjust their lives in this time of pandemic. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Carlo Acutis, pray for us. everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of Bindanao Peace Studies Conference 6. This program is initiated by Father Saturnino Urios University FSUU in partnership with Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammen Arbeit or GIZ. I am Father Fausto James A. Kabungkal from FSUU and I am your facilitator in this session this afternoon. Before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge our participants from various government and non-government agencies, healthcare providers, community and religious organizations, as well as those coming from the academe, from the state universities and colleges, private higher education institutions, SAYAP schools, and the Department of Education who are joining us in Zoom and live streaming via Facebook and YouTube channel of the university. Thank you for being with us. We also acknowledge our speakers who will be introduced accordingly in a while. The theme for our session this afternoon is Youth Leadership and Social Media in the Context of COVID-19. We shall now proceed with our program. To facilitate a seamless flow in this online conference, may I remind everyone of our session rules. All participants are encouraged to mute their microphones at the start of the session. For the documentation, all the proceedings of the conference shall be recorded and pictures will be taken during the session. For an easier recognition, it is encouraged that you indicate your organization's acronym before your name. For example, FSUU Juan de la Cruz. At this point, may I turn you over to the session moderator, Reverend Father Junre V. Aguilion. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Father Junre V. Aguilion from Father Saturnino Orius University in Butuan City. I am the moderator for this session. 
Here are the discussion overview and mechanics. Each speaker is given 20 minutes for his or her presentation. Please observe the allocated time so that the other speakers and the participants in the open forum will also have their chance to ask questions. When the speaker's time is up, we will immediately proceed to the next presenter. After all the presentations, a short panel of discussion follows and an open forum. For the open forum, the Zoom participants may write their questions on the chat box. For those who are participating through Facebook and YouTube Live, you may likewise write your questions in the comment section. The Secretariat will keep track of your questions and will forward it to us. You can ask one direct, concise question and if needed, one follow-up question. There will be documenters who will record the process and the questions raised for this session. Now, let us begin the presentations. Our first presenter in this afternoon is currently a member of Parliament and the Minority Leader of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. He is an active member of the boards of trustees of both Ateneo di Davao University and Ateneo di Zamwanga University. He is a founding member of the Board of Management and Leadership for Equity Solutions Incorporated, as well as of the Board of Kalisa Action Network or Kalisaan. She undertakes consultancies with national government agencies, local government units, NGOs, and international institutions on human rights. Fellow peace seekers, I give you our first presenter for this session, Attorney Liza Masuhud Alamia. is a um, in, internet connect, uh, interruption. So let's uh, proceed to other presenter. Our second presenter is a director of Xavier University Center for Legal Assistance, Ateneo de Cagayan College of Law. He teaches legal research, legal writing, human rights law, and environmental and natural resources law. He is a city legal junior policy advisor in Cagayan de Oro City. He is with the Philippine Youth Leadership Program, core team and legal consultant. Fellow peace advocates, I give you our presenter in this session, Attorney Ernesto B. Neri. Hello, Father. You can hear me. May hapon sa tanan. So I'll share my slide now. Claro, no? Yes, yes, Attorney. Proceed. So um, again, may hapon sa tanan. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, to begin, no, I would like to to uh, present that the overarching question that I seek to explore in my sharing is how youth leaders and youth organizations 
confined much in the digital space, are responding to the extraordinary demands of the times, defined as what I see by three major challenges. And I wish to also propose ways forward on how to develop a constituency of youth leaders as we build back better. Now, let's start with the challenges. There are three challenges, as, as I mentioned. No? First one is the widening gaps. Parang needless to say, the pandemic has exposed the inherent, not just gaps, no, but chasms in our society. The shutdown of the economy and the relegation of our world to the digital space exposed the realities and deep inequities that have long existed in our country, even before the pandemic. And this, this, this disease has its way of showing the truth about our society. There are many examples, no? Um, you see images of people already begging on the streets. But in particular, one thing that um, concerns the youth now is, you know, our education being moved to cyberspace. And the issue being raised now is the internet uh, accessibility and even speed. Um, a survey resulted that 45% of Filipinos and 74% of public schools do not have access to internet. And also much of our economy relies on services. Diba? As you can see in the graph, um, we've seen the greatest economic decline since um, 1984. And uh, I want to highlight that, that the economy relies on services. And majority of the youth, no, actually 3.8 million youth are in, in the services sector. And because of the shutdown, you've seen um, as taken in the PIBED survey, around 422 respondents said that 97 of them have stopped working, um, schooling, and they were recently unemployed, 86%. And almost all of them stopped their skills training. And another alarming challenge that we're seeing here is that the, the consequence of the lockdown is we are seeing an increased trend on child exploitation. Um, because of the stay-home orders, cases of child abuse, domestic violence increased. No, and the fact also that you know, mobility is limited made government response very hard. And let's go, move to the second challenge, the shrinking civic spaces. What do I mean by that? Now, this is not something unique in the Philippines. Most countries in the world did see uh, restrictions imposed for public health purpose. But the, you, what, what is unique in the Philippines, I think, in my own analysis, is that in the past months, we've seen unusual moves that potentially restrict the exercise of civil liberty, which is not grounded on the reason of public health. And one of the, and I think this was a discussion earlier in the, in the, in the morning session, no? um, there is this controversy surrounding the very fast passage of the anti-terrorism law. And it's now the most challenged law in the history of the Philippines. Um, this is an example of, you know, this is not really a public health concern, but why was it uh, fast track? And there's also an admission during the morning session that uh, there was really no effort in consulting public in the civil society for this. So that's what we're seeing now. It's the most challenged law there is. There are mobility restrictions. Curfews, as you can see, we need, we need to have QR codes already. There are implications on privacy, but at least those are justified uh, based on public health concern. But what is alarming for me, um, particularly for netizens online, I mean net netizens, is that they also use social media as a platform for voicing out dissent, right? Criticizing what they see are inactions or failures of government. But what has happened? In the past months, we have seen a very interesting but scary trend. Netizens are actually receiving summons. Summons from state, um, I mean, from the NBI, no? from, from state agencies, because somebody somewhere are filing libel cases against netizens who are just simply voicing out their concern against public official. So this is a an alarming uh, uh, an indicator of a shrinking civic space. And there is no relationship with, with the pandemic here. Why is there all of a sudden there is this, this sort of weaponization of the libel laws against um, loud voices in the internet? Okay. And again, um, so many were also arrested for violations of quarantine. Now the third uh, 
challenge I see is mental distress. Mental distress. Um, la, uh, the increasing concern over the youth's mental health. Imagine uh, the last time the world faced the scale of restrictions due to a virus was in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. So this experience is something very new to all of us and to this generation of people who are still growing up, the youth. And it's very taxing because suddenly we're disconnected with our family, with our friends. And then suddenly we're also anxious about school, about our parents' work, and even concerned about the virus. So there is this um, mental illness, mental distress, mental health issue among the youth that I think we're not seeing by the full picture, okay? And also, I want to highlight this because um, we are all relegated now to social media. I think it is important to highlight that there is a growing evidence of internet, uh, no, increasing evidence where the internet and social media can actually influence suicide rate related behavior. This is something that we have to talk about um, that was, I think, exacerbated because of the pandemic uh, situation. Now, with this, uh, and I think we also have to be reflective in how we consume information online. Now, with these challenges, I'll now proceed to the three roles. No? How are the youth sectors responding? And in my work in, in the city, uh, uh, in the youth sector and across Mindanao, I've seen them take up various roles. But I want to categorize the roles of youth leaders and youth orgs into three. The first one I observe is that the youth leaders, youth sectors are taking on the role of enablers. What are enablers? They build online platforms for resource collection and mobilization. They help frontline youth organizations to deliver relief and other immediate services. And they create networks of donors. And I have examples here. Um, these are just, I'm sure this is just a drop in the bucket of so many youth enablers across the Philippines. I want to highlight Kapit Filipina, Apinas. This is a nationwide effort, but the focus is in Mindanao. And what they do is they use local talents and art to call for donations. Online to lahat. And then their uh, donations are channeled to informal youth orgs or organizations in the margins. Kanang dili kakadawat ng mga relief normally. No? And then a fun forward is a CDO initiative. And um, what they do. How do they call donations? They use the compelling power of stories. They use narratives of actual people, with their consent, of course, to help promote a certain issue in a particular area. So they were able to fund various um, grassroots uh, initiatives here in the city. And also, my 20 ago, this is somewhere in Luzon, where they promote uh, donate your 20 pesos. And what's the point here? We have seen here the creative innovation of youth in maximizing online platforms to help our frontliners. They have honed the power of storytelling, creativity, and art to give. The next um, role that the youth are playing now is they are also power checkers. Ano ba yung power checkers? They build constituency to account and demand better government interventions. They challenge for see detrimental uh, government action or inaction before formal channels and they attempt to influence policy and here are some of my examples um the said earlier that the anti-terrorism law is one of the most challenged law in the country the youth sector was because um sk officials and other youth leaders did file a case in the supreme court challenging the law that's an example of the youth being power checkers there's also this uh good gov a PH, this is a, a network of youth organizations to try to improve youth participation in the local level. And, uh, and they're doing, they're training a generation of, of local public servants to improve uh, participation mechanisms in their LGU. And I want to highlight this, uh, Ken Abantes, COVID Citizens Budget Tracker. Um, Ken, I know Ken is also youth siya and uh, he's also a friend, and this is an amazing effort no, of, of how this young person used his knowledge to monitor the budget of government uh, in terms of COVID response. So what's the whole point here? What we're seeing now is the youth are maximizing their idealism and energy to stand up against what they see are injustices, and they try to organize, demand, 
and change the direction of their community or the country in general. Why? I think because the youth is unburdened by a past and they're free to imagine a better world. And what they're doing now right here is that they're demanding for a better society. And the third role, the last role I observed, is the frontliners themselves. Ang youth mismo, sila na mismo ang frontliners. They go to the community to deliver relief. They build relationships with the affected community. They generate insights from the communities. And uh, to also feed it to the, to the government uh, mechanism, uh, government services. And uh, examples here, they have their fan pages here. You can even check them out. Um, they choose particular sectors. Like, for example, Tabang Sikad chooses um, the Sikad drivers because they saw that they were really affected by the lockdown. And that's their only source of income. So they were able to uh, organize relief services. Uh, Andam Higala talks about uh, helps women you know, in, in lockdown situations. And e-school, I think this is about um, augmenting educational services to the youth. The thing here is, Kanitanan, all of these are managed, led by young people. And they directly, directly go to the community. So what is this all about? We've seen here the youth choosing to be with the people most affected by the pandemic, walking with them and serving them. And it speaks, I guess, of the courage and heroism of the youth, youth in going into places where there are more, there's more greater need, right? So that's the three roles. So what's the bigger picture now? The bigger picture is that all of these three roles address accountability, actually. They address accountability to our duty bearers. What do I mean? The three of them actually reinforce one another. How do they do that? For example, when we talk about enablers and frontliners, they're actually addressing public services. And their presence you know, raising resources and going to the community, in some sense, also draw attention to the gaps of the services of government, right? And um, that's one way of accounting power. The power checkers, on the other hand, I think we have, they, they directly engage policymakers through the change of policy, through monitoring of the budget, and even to the extent of challenging a law or even going to partisan campaigning you know, for for you know, uh, electing better leaders. And these are, are very essential uh, routes because again, when you directly engage policymakers, the quality of policy will eventually become or improve the quality of public services, which will ultimately be felt by the people. So the youth are taking this role, accounting duty bearers through public service, public services, particularly social services, and they're also engaging policymakers. Now, what do we need to do to sustain this? Ways forward. Build community of solidarity. And I'm very happy that we have with us uh, officials in the public sector who are elected public officials. I think one way of building community of solidarity is that LGU continue to support youth initiatives. And how do they do that? There's already a legal framework for that, and that's through the SK reform law. Particularly, let us continue to dis explore ways in improving our LGU development, LGU youth development offices and the youth development councils because they are be very good platforms where youth energies can be translated into public good. And like this, how do we foster sharing of experiences and ideas among youth networks? The second proposal I want to share in this, in this conference is let's develop bridging leaders. What do I mean by that? You know, when you talk about youth leadership, there's so many brands of leadership. Are you developing an organizational leader? Are you developing an events organizing leader or program builder? What kind of leader do you want? And my proposal is, I think it is important that we integrate bridging leadership in our curriculum or in our development programs in, for the youth. Um, what is the bridging leader? Well, it's an entire course, no? but to sum it up, I think a bridging leader is one that is keen sa kaiyahang values. No? And because he's so sensitive and he's so clear about his or her values, her eyes or his eyes opens up vividly and see the social divides around, around, around the, him or her. 
and he or she uses his skill to build a coalition to address the issue and in the process remake relationships in the community right that is more open inclusive and liberating that's the whole idea of you co-own you co-create with the community right and you eventually change institutional relationships and the third the third proposal is we have to integrate digital citizenship and you know i think gasgas nagidni but in our way of proceeding i think this should be emphasized what do i mean by integrate digital citizenship actually this is not something new it's just how do you translate our values in the real world and migrate them into the digital space so our question really is how do we communicate and amplify values good values in the in in the cyberspace that is our challenge as educators second how do we reduce echo chambers meaning you know dili lang ato ang gusto tong madunggan we can hear other voices and other points of views no because we all know naman that algorithms in our social media accounts tend to reinforce our biases right how do we break out of that we have to go into honest and civil conversations with people who disagree with us and then i think it's important ultimately that the youth should know their rights their rights and how to enforce their rights because uh, i think this is an essential adult skill already an essential adult need that we have to know the rights because um in order to protect these rights we have to know them you have to know them right so i'm i don't know if i'm very fast pero uh, this i hope fits the 20 minutes time i'm now in my last slide so how do i summarize all of the things i said the gun ke three community i think our goal is to transform in terms of youth leadership transform the mindset of the young people from the present state which is i think we treat them as clients meaning they are beneficiaries they are merely recipients of services you know they're just warm bodies if you need some uh, event they you invite the youth so that they will fill the entire gym let's stop doing that we have to transform the mindset of youth being mere clients to that of another c and that is citizens we have to build a citizenship mindset and what does that entail i think it entails us as mentors recognizing their agency their autonomy and their ability to assert themselves in the decision making process and as leaders our role i think is we should build the platform for them to participate and i then go back to our suggestion that we have to strengthen our youth councils across our lgus and also rethink on how we form leaders in our own school are we forming youth leaders just to be part of the economy or are we forming leaders who will transform the economy that will address the deep rooted problems of our society so i think that is uh pretty much my uh, sharing and I hope everybody can reflect on the points and we can move forward and build a better world after COVID is gone. Mayong hapon sa tanah. Thank you, Attorney Ernesto B. Neri for your sharing. Fellow peace seekers, let us now listen to our next presenter Attorney Liza Masuhud Alamia in her presentation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you are able to um, uh, hear me uh, clearly. We have some problems on uh, network here. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, all of the participants to the Mindanao Peace Conference. About 30 years ago, mobile phones were used only for voice calls. A cellular mobile phone service was first offered in the Philippines back in 1991. And text messaging was introduced uh, three years later. 
mobile phones cost a fortune at that time. With the Nokia 3310 price of about 14,000 pesos, and even SIM cards, roughly 1,000 pesos each were expensive. Back then, people could identify phones at a glance and memorize each other's numbers. For many of us, it was difficult to imagine we would eventually hold in our hands a device that would serve not only as a phone, but as a digital camera and work computer too. Back then, bringing bulky, heavy machines like cameras and computers required counting for the effort and space needed to carry them. Now, science made these advancements possible, of course. But if we can time travel and show a child living in the 90s the technology that we have today, if we told them they would someday hold the computer in their hands and can connect the internet without wires, if we brought out our smartphones and show what it can do even without an internet connection, it would be nothing short of a magical moment. Yesterday's magic is our reality today. That reality, built on constantly evolving technology, has also redefined our relationships. In an increasingly online world, social network is often associated with Facebook and Twitter, uh, before it is associated with relationships we develop online, offline. We receive live updates, posts, and tweets more than we have conversations in person. And online content seeps into our conversations as we use memes and hashtags as reference. Social media is built around online communities where we interact with people, sometimes engaging in debate develop bonds that would have been non-existent if not for social media, and we cut ties through unfriending or unfollowing. Some would even say a relationship is not official until it is Facebook or Instagram official. The internet and by extension social media have allowed us to expand or limit our social networks as we occupy virtual spaces in ways we would never have imagined. Also unimaginable were COVID-19 and the global pandemic, even as it happened right in front of our eyes. We started washing our hands more often, wearing masks in public, and restricting physical contact. We had to adjust our way of life as social distancing, uh, social distancing eventually became the norm. If there is anything in the internet uh, that has bridged to the years, it is distance. And so our reliance on the internet and social media is part of the so-called new normal, which also meant we had to deal with new challenges that rendered some of our old solutions inadequate, if not obsolete. Far from being an issue of public health, government response to COVID-19 had to consider a range of issues from livelihood to education, especially for the young people who have just started providing for their families or still in school work from home schemes and mixed distance learning modules rely heavily on the internet with social interactions limited mostly to social media. Now, this presents a difficulty. With only 67% of Filipinos having an internet connection, right now I'm having a problem on my internet connection. Almost all of them access the internet via a smartphone with 97% using a prepaid mobile connection. Almost all internet users aged 16 to 64 use messaging apps or social networking apps. So the youth is at a very unique position when it comes to online communities. In the Philippines, 94% of people aged 18 to 29 say they have an online presence, which is a stark contrast to those aged above 15. Uh, of whom only 36% are online. However, being online does not mean having a good internet connection. Out of 85 countries, the Philippines rank 77th in terms of internet speed and 82nd in terms of affordability. This, aside from technology and device costs, makes other parts of the internet inaccessible, while social media may be accessed for free, depending on available mobile network products. Due to the pandemic, 49 of 85 countries have experienced a drop in mobile internet speeds, while broadband speeds slowed in 44 countries as work from home schemes and distance modes became part of quarantine methods. But even without these figures, it is, interesting, it is easy to see the impact of COVID-19 on the youth, 
with the marked increase in online appeals from students seeking donations for mobile devices uh, and or better internet connection. Personal spaces that used to be devoted for rest are now also shared spaces of institutional learning and labor. As costs once covered by institutions are passed on to households with budgets already stretched due to the pandemic. The pandemic is not simply a new and singular problem, but one that compounds all deeply rooted problems. These problems are already here. In 2018, the Philippine Statistics Authority released multidimensional poverty statistics, which was based on 13 indicators across four social dimensions, namely education, housing, water, and sanitation, health and nutrition, and employment. The statistics show that five out of 10 families were deprived of basic education or had one family member aged 18 years old and above who did not complete basic education pre-pandemic. Roughly one out of 10 families were either burdened by underemployment or had working children who were out of school. Figures regarding unemployment and out of school youth were not included in the study. Although it must be noted that unemployment rose from 5.4% in July 2019 to 10% in 2020. Meanwhile, one out of 10 Filipinos aged 6 to 34 were among the out-of-school children and youth, according to the 2016 Annual Poverty Statistics. However, these figures only reflect the national situation. There may be regions faring better or worse than others based on the national average. And this doesn't bode well for regions dealing with armed conflict or disasters linked to natural hazards. And then there are regions dealing with both disasters and uh, this, uh, armed conflict and disasters linked to natural hazards, from the mountains of eastern Mindanao to the plains of central Mindanao in Maguindanao in Lanao del Sur, and to the island provinces of Basilan Sulu and Tawi Tawi beyond the mainland's western coast. Mindanao and you know this more than anyone. These social inequalities are deep realities for all of us, and I have experienced this since I was younger. These challenges led me down the path of human rights work eventually serving in the Bangsamoro regional government. In the Bangsamoro, the challenges that come with distance and discrimination have long been felt. At 63.1%, child poverty is highest in the barn in the whole country, more than twice the national average, with 1.6 out of the 2.5 million children in the region living below the poverty line. The number of out-of-school youth and adults is also significantly worse, with almost 45% of those aged 16 to 30 are out of school. This is double the national average. This is why Leadership among the Bangsamoro youth who are in the audience now, I hope you're listening. Leadership among you is increasingly important. Change demands leadership and vision. And the Bangsamoro youth have consistently proven themselves capable of demanding and enacting change in their communities. Many of us took on leadership roles, not because it makes our resumes better, but because it is necessary to win back our rights. The Bangsamoro youth mobilized in our communities to raise awareness about our people's history, lobbied for anti-discrimination policies in the national government, government, and even took up arms to take part in the struggle for self-determination that our elders started in their youth. Now, the youth must also take part in leading the Bangsamoro transition government towards an inclusive and just future. While we work towards opportunities for youth participation in government, the youth must also organize and mobilize towards building political parties that genuinely represent them, not just to take part in the elections, but to carry out initiatives that will shape their political participation and the future of those who will inherit our joint efforts. Because our vision today may not necessarily be realized within our lifetime. Our efforts are not only meant to change our present conditions, but are also directed towards the future we hope to build. It may be an inspiring to hear that many of the social inequalities I faced as a young Muslim and Bangsamoro woman growing up in Sambuanga City are hardly different from the inequalities that you are facing today. But this is our shared reality. And there will be times when an unprecedented global pandemic will hit while we continue to deal 
with the reality of climate change, stretching our already meager resources to its limits. But remember this as well. Growing up, I had no computer and did most of my schoolwork by home. I had to do research by reading books in the library, some of them old and dated. Most of my friends were children in my neighborhood, and my first encounter with a phone involved a landline. Calling someone outside of Zamboanga meant having an expensive conversation, and mobile phones were seen more as a luxury than a necessity during my time. Your generation, despite persistent social inequalities, now have better access to technology and information than my generation ever did. Your voice that used to be yours alone can now be shared and retweeted by those who agree with your stand on issues. And your potential can now extend beyond your immediate communities. You can collaborate with youth from other parts of the country and the world. All you need is a shared cause and a desire to change things for the better. Your generation has Twitter, where hashtags like uh, hashtag rescue PH and hashtag relief PH help track rescue operations and relief goods. Your generation has Facebook, where a single post can find itself with an audience of thousands. You can call and send messages to friends and family without having to memorize each other's name numbers, because that's what we did. And you can contact people whom you believe can help your cause by simply finding their social media accounts and sending a private message or reply to a public post. In 2017, remember, the global hashtag MeToo movement spread highlighting the abuse and harassment women experience around the world. First used in 2006 by activist Tarana Burke in a MySpace campaign, it helped support for young survivors of sexual abuse and gender-based violence. Here in the Philippines, hashtag Babae Ako started in 2018 as a statement against state-endorsed misogyny and went viral as a statement against gender-based violence and discrimination. Since then, Discussions surrounding male privilege in patriarchal institutions have been a constant topic in our news feeds and timelines. However, as with all things, what may be a blessing can also be a curse. We know how quickly fake news anchored on misinformation or disinformation can spread online. We know how the internet and social media have been weaponized to discredit journalists, activists, human rights workers, and others fighting for their rights and freedoms. We know about the many ways it becomes easier for climate change deniers and violent extremists to find an audience and consolidate their ranks, making it easier for them to establish a foothold in the spaces they move in. In 2011, report cl reports claimed that the United Nations declared access to the internet as a basic human right. However, this is not entirely accurate. What it did say in a report is that the internet boosts economic, social, and political development and contributes to the progress of humankind as a whole by vastly expanding the capacity of individuals to enjoy their right to freedom of opinion and expression, which is an enabler of human rights. It is important to remember that the internet and social media are merely tools. We can use that in changing the world for the better while building on the work the generations before us have accomplished offline. Every step online must be matched with a couple of steps offline, if only to make sure that our online initiatives are able to reach offline communities that may be suffering from a greater uh, degree um, of uh, suffering from a greater degree of all of these uh, injustices. Sorry, I'm having problems. Okay. Now, Think of a problem that has long been left unsolved in your community and imagine the ways we can solve it through online campaigns and offline initiatives. Imagine a future where these problems can be solved with more ease if not solved entirely. The systemic violence and structural oppression we have struggled with for generations will likely persist for years to come and it is our responsibility to push the struggle forward in ways that will be significant, not only for the present, but also for the future. In using the internet and social media, our responsibility is not only to find ways to share our thoughts and ideas to people, but also to share access to resources and information necessary to shape 
informed opinions and meaningful plans of actions towards change. I think of the child I once was, a girl who would have found infinite wonders and joy in the world we are living in right now. A world of phones that work like computers powered by an internet connection that links the Philippines to Europe or North America. A world of conversations involved thousands of people expressing their thoughts all at once and how she could have solved some of the problems her generation faced using the tools we have in our hands right now. My imagination as a child could have not possibly conjured the technology we have today. But I'd like to think that the same imagination, along with strength and conviction of my own social networks, have nurtured Weights you will be more, not simply because of the advancements in science and technology, but because of your willingness to learn new things, to share ideas and collaborate with others, and to empower each other through movements fueled by solidarity and collective action. Finally, my last slide, you carry the promise of magic in your hands today, and you have the opportunity to make believers out of skeptics as we work towards healing and change in a post-COVID world. Remember that building the new normal does not have to be an initiative based on settling for bare minimums and accepting the status quo with little to no resistance. Instead, the new normal could mean building a world where we genuinely acknowledge social inequalities and uplift those to disproportionately carry the consequences of these inequalities squarely on their shoulders. With the rise of the new normal, a new approach to governance and a new way of life can also begin. With that, maraming salamat po. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Attorney Liza Masuhud Alamiya for your sharing. Our third presenter, graduated from OB Montessori in Green Hills and received a bachelor's degree in communication at Miriam College. She also received a master's degree in public management from the Ateneo School of Government when she was serving as the vice mayor of San Manuel. She is recently busy giving relief goods to her constituents during the outbreak of the coronavirus. Currently, she is the municipal mayor of San Manuel Tarlac. Fellow peacemakers, our third presenter of this session, Honorable Donia Crescencia Reyes Tesoro. Welcome, ma'am. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, hello, po. Um, Hi, good day to all. I hope you are all safe and uh, I hope uh, you are not hugely affected by the pandemic. I hope uh, your work, your families, and uh, your mental health are all doing well. And uh, um, maraming salamat. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am extending my gratitude from Luzon to Mindanao. And uh, to the people behind this event, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be one of your speakers for the Mindanao uh, Peace Studies Conference to talk about youth leadership and social media in the context of COVID-19. So um, I think you mga speakers, Kanina, they've uh, given a complete and very informative um, information on uh, the role of the youth no? in the, the modern world right now, especially that um, uh, our service is very much uh, required and uh, needed in the communities. And expect that my discussion would be brief, not serious. Everything you hear are all my personal views and insights, uh, maybe my personal opinion also. Kaya wala din pong PowerPoint. And uh, the last speakers mentioned already mentioned the best ways on how the youth can actively participate um, with the government and both the government and community affairs. So uh, thank you so much again. So to give you a brief background about myself, because uh, si Father, I think uh, si Father, your moderator, natin, um, 
didn't mention that I have been in service for almost eight years. I started really young, but believe me when I say that I'm still on my 20s. I'm still on my 20s and uh, still here on my eighth year. And uh, for the longest time that I've um, served San Manuel, I have learned everything now. All the systems, lahat ng mga kilangan mo lang from the legislative to executive. I have learned everything from the bottom up until now that I became a municipal mayor. And uh, for the longest time that I worked for the government, I have never seen a shift as big as this on how we run things. So the pandemic has truly changed you know, our lives permanently, but it has brought out the best in all of us, lalong lalo na uh, with the youth, no, sa mga kabataan. I hope na okay lang that I speak a little bit of Tagalog. So, uh, uh, who would have thought no, that a lot of the youth are courageous, they speak um, bravely, and uh, they stepped up uh, when it comes to uh, uh, helping their fellow Filipinos, whether you're from Luzon, Visayas, or Mindanao, everyone was just united, and uh, they were there to support each other. And who would have thought that we are all compassionate, you know, this COVID-19 has exposed the hero in every Filipino, no matter what religion, no matter what race, no matter what we believe in. Um, we realized that uh, as one nation you know, and uh, as, part of, as part of this world, we are all interconnected in a way now. We must help each other in order to survive. You know? We are all equal. You know? And uh, we also realized that the role of the youth with the situation right now is very crucial, especially now that we live in a digital age and uh, those knowledgeable and uh, uh, th those experts with technology are the youth, right? Tayo, tayo, tayo. And all of a sudden, of course, Bayanihan made sense again for everybody, no matter where you're from. And I believe that the leaders that we have now during uh, this digital age are more felt and seen. We used to call it EPA, but we see it on social media. We call some of our uh, politicians, we call them EPA, we call them Papansen. But for us, no, being in public service, we call it transparency. We, wanna, we want our people to, to see what we're actually doing in the government. And at the same time, empower the people to also do the same. We inspire by sharing... Um, the, the good practices that we do in our local government units in order to show, especially the younger generation, that this is how things are done and this is how they should be uh, doing it also. And if ever there are mistakes, then they can change it. Right? Because if we all contribute something good to the community, I'm sure we will all have uh, a better future. So being a young leader, we also, I noticed then also that uh, we are open to criticism and uh, uh, we are not like the traditional politicians who uh, but, but, um, we, we seldom see politicians who who, anyway, who admit the, the, the mistakes that they do. But I think millennial leaders right now, although we are still prone to mistakes, but we listen. We don't just surround ourselves with people who's just gonna praise us for the good deeds that we do. But, we also, parang we'd rather be surrounded by honest people who's gonna tell us when we're lacking and uh, when we make the wrong decisions, you know. And, um, ayun, because we, we use it to improve ourselves and the office that we represent, diba? Kaya nga, we also use the social media because through the social media, we, we do not only communicate with the people on what they need, pero they're also, nakakomment din sila ng mga negative stuff, which is, which is in reality might be true, which is a, which could not be political, but it might be really what's happening on the ground. Kaya we consider them as uh, constructive criticisms and we use it to improve our services. At the end of the day, utosan mga manakal ng mga tao, and I follow kung ano ba yung uh, calls ng public. And I think one of the good traits of millennial leaders, like I said, is that we value the opinion of other people. Not being too naive and not being too overly confident, but it is um, only knowing and trusting that each of us in the government is accountable to our every action. There's always a balance, a check, check and balance in the government. And uh, although the, the, mostly the liabilities 
nasa local chief executive but the people under us are also liable for any mistake that could be that could happen so uh, it's also good to put trust in the people around you so that they speak up yun yung maganda pag mga bata yung mga kasama mo sa trabaho because we are all uh, open minded and we share our opinion and we accept it and uh, that is why i empower the people who work for me to speak up on what are the best solution to every problem. I, I, all, I always mention this, eh. uh, parang during this one TV interview, I was asked kung, uh, that in my leadership as a youth, uh, what do I do when I commit mistakes? I tell them, when I, when I tell them every, everything I do, you know, every, pro, every program, every project, I consult with the people around me. Because most of the time, yung solution na sa kanila because they know better and uh, showing the people around you trust also mean them trusting you as well and making them feel that their expertise matter especially when they're new to the job makes the work fast and efficient to government especially if you try working for the government it's not very competitive it's a uh, it's a uh, medyo mabagal you know parang uh, uh, sometimes the work isn't efficient because uh, um, yeah, people are very complacent with their work. Kaya nga, very, very, uh, napakaganda kung ang leader, especially the young ones, we are taught to be uh, results-oriented. And uh, uh, we base all our um, all our outputs on that. So, um, and I think uh, being a millennial mayor, uh, there's a feeling of oneness, not only to your fellow youth, but with the whole world. And we understand that in order to survive, we must support each other. And that is how, I, I think that that was how I survived the recent calamities, because I was able to connect not just to my constituents, but to many Filipinos from all over the country to which I got support from. Siguro yun yung naging edge ko, because Ever since I started my political career, you know, um, hindi pa man nagpo-post yung mga politicians or I always post what I do, you know, kaya pe people relate to me a lot and people are very much comfortable approaching me and talking to me kasi uh, I've opened myself na uh, on social media and that's how I improve the services that I give. So... Uh, during the crisis, everything was done through strategies that are actually very practical. You know, uh, our approach has always been preventive. That is number one. When, I, when I'm being asked kung ano naging secret, kung bakit uh, magaba yung cases namin and uh, yung success rate ng San Manuel when it comes to the disaster uh, risk um, municipal uh, disaster risk reduction namin was because we were very much prepared, you know. Parang nakikita ko pa lang sa ibang countries. I'm already telling my 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 health officer and uh, my uh, MDRRMO to uh, to do this and that. Parang new preparedness namin uh, talaga uh, hinanda namin yung aming mga sarili. We always say prevention is better than cure, and that is always true, especially with this pandemic. And the key actually to containing it what, to, what was to simply block it off as early as we could you know as i saw an article once that studies show that women especially the younger ones value preparation more than men do and that is a big factor why we see many emerging women leaders all over the world who stepped up in containing the spread of the virus in their areas you see in taiwan in taiwan and in countries like maybe new zealand Na as early as uh, as early as uh, uh, may breakout sa ibang country in Wuhan, talagang nagkaroon na sila ng uh, ban on travels and uh, you know these are all the uh, prevention on um, on uh, future outbreaks and uh, it is something that uh, we did here sa bayan namin that is why uh, meron kami ng uh, um, good feedback when it comes to our emergency response. And uh, San Manuel was one of the few first implemented the quarantine pass system. 
and uh, we equipped our frontliners, made sure they are healthy, uh, we gave them vitamins, food, and we, we compensated them for their service. Although maliit lang yung municipio ko, we have limited funds, but I, uh, I'm thankful for having many friends and uh, talagang, uh, I was I worked very hard to, to compensate the services of our frontliners. Alam nyo, um, hindi ninyo uh, maisip siguro, I mean, not everyone knows, but, but the salary or the honorarium of the barangay uh, officials or the barangay workers down to the barangays are not as much. No? So um, that is uh, one way we can uh, uh, encourage them to work hard for uh, these princes. And I, I also felt the need to purchase food and medicines early because I saw what happened to other countries. And I didn't want to purchase over price supplies. And I also initiated quickly the establishment of isolation centers like the ones I saw in China. We never used school facilities. And uh, right now, um, anyway, ayun. so our approach to the pandemic was more on prevention, but we certainly were able to handle cases properly through early detection. Uh, through the R0. Isa kami sa mga unang naggamit ng R0 because I adapted this from uh, a friend in Manila, you know, from one of the uh, one of the big companies in Manila, and then they were using the R0 system. And uh, ayun, and tracing, you know, and effective quarantine protocols. It's all a matter of educating oneself on what ano yung dapat gawin. And then, I think based on uh, I think uh, on prioritization um, that our, all of our constituents were affected in different ways. So we had to reprioritize or refocus our projects to be able to help them survive and then recover. So as a municipal mayor, I must help the agriculture sector by subsidizing. I must help the businesses survive and recover through stimulus packages. I must help those who lost their jobs start all over again through micro-enterprise development. And uh, not a San Manuelenio should go hungry. Yan ang palagi ko kong sinasabi. I even tell my people kahit mamutang na uh, ito yung main goal natin, that everyone's healthy and uh, zero casualty. And um, and thank goodness, ganun pa rin naman until now. And then... Um, I think it's the advantage also of working at the grassroots level and also uh, starting very early on because I saw what really needs to be prioritized more on uh, more, more on what the public officials up there could think. So, so no offense to the national, you know, the national government uh, officials, pero kasi iba yung nakikita mo sa baba sa nakikita mo from up there. You know, it's hard to talk about innovation and technology without thinking that we are so much behind computer technology and healthcare. You know, how will we compete to become globally competitive? Youth leadership aims that, you know, aims innovation, but at the same time looks into the root of certain issues of why the country is so much left behind in so many aspects. I saw how modern politics, you know, uh, not to, uh, no, not to, um, not to offend anybody, mga politicians, because I know that sumusulad lang sila sa trend or what the people want. You know. But alam mo, alam nyo, uh, I started politics and I saw how politicians, how the government prioritized, govern, uh, how they prioritized mga basketball courts instead of uh, instead of school buildings. You know how. Uh, how politicians prioritize events rather than build uh, health centers. That is why now I am building my own healthcare facility. And right now, I am modernizing the education department. But this crisis has opened our eyes to so many shortcomings that, that are always there under, right under our noses. Pero hindi natin na-realize that we are so much left behind. Na parang kinailangan pong magkaroon ng COVID for us to realize na yung mga public school teachers pala natin, hindi lahat sila magaling sa computer. Yung mga youth pala natin, magagaling sila sa social media, but it, when it comes to computer technology, hindi pala natin alam. You know? So, these things are uh, these things are higher standards that the youth now can actually implement. Because we are now seeing 
uh, what needs to be changed, di ba? And um, yun, parang uh, now we are shifting to these things kung kailan late na, pero we should be doing long time ago na. And uh, well, anyway, this pandemic has uh, given this government the opportunity to take the, 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 to take this crisis into a chance to change and grow, diba? And change from the old ways, especially with the presence of the youth, you know, the pressure coming from, um, from the biggest uh, voting bloc of our population, which is the youth, then the government would definitely be implementing these uh, big changes in the years to come. And uh, yes, yeah, social media has helped me a lot on this fight against the pandemic. It wasn't just an entertainment platform, diba? but it served as a vital tool for information dissemination and as an emergency response tool as well. You know, during lockdowns, it's how we continuously communicate with the people and made sure the, the citizens were well informed. You know, the social media was a tool to educate to fight the disease, it is the most powerful invention of the modern age, diba? And uh, experts need to RD. You know, through it, we can either build, shape, create, or break. We can build connections. We can create new norms, you know, better than before. We can shape the future, diba? In other countries, the social media can even overthrow or elect an individual during elections. So, ayun, recently, it enabled us to spread awareness on how to, per, how to prevent contracting the virus and even instructions on how to handle oneself in case they get infected to less the burden of medical facilities. Because that's what I did before. It's better mostly what we see on social media are all parang nananakot tayo, di ba? Parang we, we scare people that uh, uh, more on prevention, eh, that uh, more on ways on how to prevent it. Pero ako, my approach during the, uh, the the quarantine, you know, in the middle of the quarantine, was how to manage yourself when you contract the virus. Because that's education, and that's educating your people that that uh, uh, the, the the virus may be something you 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 could be scared of, but also it could be something that you could prevent, and at the same time manage also on your own. So. So the people knew what to do and they knew what to report certain situations that may put their lives at risk through the social media. And uh, ayun, I hope each and everyone never forget the essence of being a youth. Some may be forgetting that we have a purpose in this world to change what needs to be changed in the best way possible. And that is what I'm doing right now. Kaya I'm struggling uh, to stay in the government uh, although I would not say it's it, that politics is dirty. I'm gonna say that but politics is actually a privilege, you know, to do something, and uh, that is what uh, what's uh, very much uh, that is what's very um, uh, how do I say this? Parang uh, yung encouraging, yung parang that's what's very encouraging and yung uh, nakakatuwa that we see a lot of millennial mayors around because the youth has a voice and uh, we certainly dominate the different social media platforms and we are able to share our voice from people to people from different walks of life different races around the globe right now ako from Luzon I am talking to our friends from Mindanao you know, who has a different religion a different culture and a different belief but we have the power to influence. That is why we should be responsible in using these powerful tools only for the good of humanity. So the development of this nation depends on how we educate our people and we educate through the social media. So it is only right that we only share the truth. So um, in public service, uh, we only want to share what is good you know, the facts, you know, all the good things that is happening. And if we post what is bad, then might as well post solutions for that too. Diba? Only share what would benefit others and what would bring hope and positivity, especially now that I believe that a large segment of the working class disproportionately affected belong to the youth. You know? And every student in this country, every learner struggles 
to build his or her foundation for a better future because he, he she can't go to school for face-to-face -face, uh, lessons. And youth leadership certainly has the edge to build higher standards than the ones before us. With the power of technology and the knowledge at hand, we can build innovations from education to healthcare and fight for advocacy is vital to the country's growth. And the youth are not afraid to speak up and are not afraid for, of traditions, you know, even traditional politics. And I myself, I remain non-partition and stick only to what is good for this country. And we only live once. And I hope we all realize that we were given a mind, uh, a body, and a heart to make a difference in other people's lives. Stay woke and empowered. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much. And keep safe. Thank you, Mayor Dunya Crescencia Reyes Tesoro, for your sharing. Our last resource person will be sharing his inputs through pre-recorded interview. He is a news anchor or journalist in GMA Network and a UN Goodwill Ambassador. He has garnered several awards. Best Male for Field Reporter 2013 from Com Guild Award, Best News Magazine Program for Patrol ng Pilipino 2012 from the Catholic Mass Media Awards, Best News Magazine for Program for Patrol ng Pilipino 2011 from the KBP Golden Dove Awards, to name a few. He graduated BS Applied Physics from UP National Institute of Physics in 2005, Philippine Science High School in 2000, and Ateneo de Manila Grade School in 1996. My friends, I give you our fourth presenter for this session. Mr. Alfonso Tomas Atom P. Araujo. Okay. So good evening. I'm Rochelle. I am from Father Saturnin Orius University. And I have some questions here. The first is what role should media play in the fight against COVID 19 and in the recent onslaught of natural calamities that we have? So, what should media play in this? Um, the role of media when it comes to natural disasters, um, well, both natural and man-made disasters, I think it's pretty clear. Um, the pandemic and also the onslaught of five you know, storms in the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, it's made it very clear the need for timely and relevant information. Uh, and that is basically the role of media um, ever since uh, media has been expected to uh, deliver information, um, verified information, and you know, with the necessary context to millions of Filipinos, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. Yep. Um, so this is literally life-saving information that uh, right. the, the media is uh, expect, expected to, to gather mm -hmm. and to, uh, you know, and to present in a easily understandable manner. Um, and again, in a timely fashion. So um, I think the, the, the lesson is pretty clear, you know, now, despite the uh, advantages of uh, social media, of the internet, and the fact that people are now closer together and can easily uh, talk to each other using different social media platforms, um, the role of media is still very important. In fact, it might be more important now yeah. than it was um, decades ago because of uh, the challenges of misinformation and disinformation. 
you were in Tacloban when you landed struck and we will not forget that footage with you right in the street with the floods coming and the winds coming and you saw firsthand how the super typhoon had flattened that part of the Visayas. Um, now recently we had this series of typhoons that left damages which had the same magnitude as Yolanda although less casualties but the damages are still there. Apparently our Kababayans in this um in this in this um in these areas where which were hit have no peace of mind now because there is a lack of uh, lack of or a need for long-term solutions in their area what is your take on the government's response on long-term solutions um i think it's pretty clear that we have uh some way to go when it comes to long-term solutions and putting right. in place necessary you know structures and institutions that can help us uh, minimize the damage of future calamities uh, the philippines is located in a in a very tumultuous very volatile region right uh, the pacific ring of fire we have uh, very strong typhoons yung climate change so we expect more frequent and more violent weather events coming in the next few decades it's it's inescapable it's not something uh we can avoid pang mga pumuputok na vulcan earlier right. this year uh, taal volcano erupted here in uh in, in Luzon affecting so many people um of course um you have flooding, you have landslides, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, uh, like, like uh, I mentioned, uh, the spread of disease as well, uh, which you can consider natural, but also a man-made catastrophe, um, which can also be linked to climate change. So um, the challenges are there, and uh, we it would be foolish for anyone to, be, uh, to take these challenges and not prepare for them right. uh, because uh, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when in fact it's going to happen year after year and um if you want to boost the you know the much vaunted resilience of filipinos that's not just a matter of attitude that's a matter of structure that's a matter of that's right um you know a support system which comes from the very top um, yung mga kababayan naman natin, nandiyan naman yan eh. Uh, matatatag na yung mga yan, marami na mga pinagdaanan. Uh, pero um, I think we lack the institutional knowledge to be able to pass down the lesson from calamity to calamity, from administration. Undoy. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, yun na nga, undoy, no? Merong endong, undoy, uh, tumama pa yung Yolanda. Uh, Disease. I mean, so many, so, so many of these events. Um, so, in terms of long-term solutions, parang hindi pa, hindi pa talaga natin nakikita na very robust yung plano sa ganon. Kasi uh, yung huli na lang, no, yung nangyari sa Marawi na nagkaroon ng um, uh, months That's... long uh, na labanan don. Hanggang ngayon, I think uh, they haven't. They're not even halfway through the rehabilitation of. of what I heard is only thirty percent has been rehabilitated so far. Exactly, which is dismal. Um, whichever yeah, way you look, that's right. It's been three years since the fighting has stopped. Mm -hmm. um, so, means that magaling tayo sa emergency response. Um, you know, to varying degrees. Sometimes not so much, but sometimes we do it well. But for the most part, doing sa rebuilding and rehabilitation, it's just a lot. We don't have that kind of resilience. Well, we always pride ourselves as being a resilient people, we the Filipinos. But recently, netizens slammed, um, slammed this uh, fact that resilience is being exploited and even glorified. What can you say about it? Well, um, it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, right. I don't think there's any reason to minimize the resilience of Filipinos because we are resilient. Um, uh, resilience can be defined in so many ways. 
um, part of resilience is the mere fact of, you know, the simple fact of being able to to bounce back after so many calamities, you know. And based on uh, an objective analysis of the situation, um, Filipinos can do that. The only problem is when, when we stop at resilience and when uh, those in authority kind of uh, uh, romanticize the idea of resiliency. Uh, of resiliency and use it as an excuse not to act. Right. Uh, so I think, um, although I understand the criticism and uh, I'm totally in agreement that um, resilience is definitely not enough, um, we also have to recognize uh, that for pe many people on the ground, resilience is all they have uh, because precisely because they, they, they aren't really protected well enough. And uh, there's, no, there's no reason not to celebrate that as well. Um, but again, um, you have to give them more than that. You yeah. have to give them more than resilience. Uh, you have created very good documentaries, and the one, uh, Nang Tumigil Ang Mundo, gave you a window to the communities that were heavily affected by the COVID, um, COVID pandemic. What do you think is the government's um, response in handling COVID-19? You have seen for yourself firsthand those communities that were badly hit. What can you say about it? Well, um, it's hard for me to make a comprehensive assessment. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert. I didn't really study this uh, in a very uh, sy systemic or in a very organized fashion. Um, what, what I can share is just my observations, um, which might be limited to what I was able to cover, um, which admittedly is not, not really a lot, considering that the pandemic hit the entire Philippines. Um, I, I see the I see the the effort. I see the definite gains that we've made over the past few months. Um, but uh, I think it's not controversial for me to say that uh, um, the response could have been better. Um, In what aspects, for example? Well, I mean the mere the mere fact that almost half a million people are infected, right. um, you know. X and I think we have we have the longest lockdown in the world. Exactly, we had we had the longest lockdown in the world. So many people uh, have been infected. A lot of people have died. People have lost their jobs. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. It's a behind, parang um, there's a there's a way of handling the pandemic at least based on the response of other countries where the impact can be lessened. You know, I mean, wala namang may gusto na magkaroon ng COVID-19, di ba? Oo, oh, um, Pero, uh, kumbaga, lalo na nung simula, parang merong, may konting, ano, may konting inertia na hindi na overcome agad. Right. Maybe because, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the response and the institutions aren't in place to be able to respond quickly to something like this. So yung testing, uh, it took a while before we were able to ramp up testing. Uh, yung test tracing yung, then. Why the tracing? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yung tracing, um, hanggang ngayon, hindi pa siya kasing robust. Um, kasi parang sunog yun eh. Kailangan, maliit pa lang na kukontain mo na eh. Ang uh, problema lumaki na siya ng lumaki so it became harder and harder to fight it. Uh, so um, you know uh, I, I want to be as as uh, fair as I can in making a personal judgment about how we uh, responded to the COVID-19 pandemic but uh, the 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 shortcomings are there uh, and it's easy to see that there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, that you know we should we should just um, accept and we should just uh, be humble enough to to recognize because like I said hindi naman first time na mangyayari ito uh, so sana natutunan na natin na when it comes to a pandemic transparency is very important uh, very quick action 
uh, uh, tracing and and uh, testing and tracing is paramount. And listening to to experts, listening to the scientists. Right. Um, yun yung mga bagay na nakita natin from the experience of other countries that worked for them. You know, um, we see that apparently one one uh, problem gives birth to another. Are you seeing new types of conflict arising from this pandemic? For instance, the delivery of social services. New types of conflict. Um, well, uh, what I can see is that it it made the uh, the the disparity, the, the, the wide diff chasm between the haves and the have-nots, right. uh, it became, you know, more, even more highlighted, uh, even worse than before. Um, I say, you know, like uh, people, people with the means were able to kind of just shelter in place and uh, ride out the storm. But people who had to 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 really work on a daily basis uh, to put food on the table, um, frontline workers mostly, you know, um, they were basically left high and dry, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. So, um, in terms of social services, kasama na rin yun, kasi um, the social the delivery the delivery of social services in the Philippines has been another eh, one that is um, marked by a deep inequality between people who can afford it and people who, who don't can't afford it um, when it comes to healthcare when it comes to education um, you know these basic services um, it, there's a price tag eh. um, if you want quality service uh it, the question is can you afford it yeah and and the pandemic when the pandemic happened uh lalo pang naging malaki yung problema na yun kasi um people with with the means kahit papano can go to good hospitals can get them can get tested um can pay for the electric bill without having to leave the house merong work from home options they have internet, so they can do Zoom meetings, for example. But people who don't have that, uh, alimbawa, yung mga, yung mga chopper, yung mga jeepney drivers who all of a sudden had to resort to begging in the streets kasi wala talaga silang kita. Yeah, that's all, that was so heartbreaking, you know, seeing them on the streets. Exactly. And um, parang these are precisely the people who need support. And, and we thought we thought that calamities like this is an equalizer, but a new situation is emerging in the Philippine society. As you said, parang mas lumawak yung gap ngayon ng those who have and those who have not. Exactly. It became more, it became more stark. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, that only goes to show that uh, uh, hindi, hindi ubre yung ano eh, yung puro dole outs lang. Na parang right. pag merong Pag merong nangyaring disaster, saka lang kikilos, magbibigay ng dole outs, magbibigay ng cash. Which is, I mean, malaking tulong yun. Pero kung, kung in the first place, mahina yung delivery mo ng social services, um, lalo lang sasama yung ganyang sitwasyon kapag nagkaroon ng emergency. So there should be more concrete um, things in, in place. Um, there, Of course, there's this big talk about, you know, the giant media network denied of the franchise renewal and some claims that it sent a chilling chilling effect among the media practitioners in the country. Is there a truth to this claim? Is the Philippine media free enough or is it muzzled in some ways? What's your take? I can only speak as an individual. Um, I can't really represent any particular organization. Um, but I mean, Theoretically, it's clear that uh, something like that, when you see a big network like ABS-CBN getting shuttered uh, just like that, um, it's hard to imagine other journalists not feeling intimidated uh, right. by, by that whole uh, situation. 
Um, and even if they don't admit it, um, it has an effect on how we do our stories, how we report our stories. Correct. We do our best to, to try and be as independent, as courageous as before. Um, but um, the, the, the effect of, of uh, something like that, which is, in my opinion, a, an issue of press freedom, it does, ha it does uh, have concrete effects on how, on how media workers do, do their job. Um, kasi marami naman sa mga media workers, ano rin eh, they, they, they have to work to live. And uh, if they are in fear that they might lose their job, or baka mapag-initan sila because of what they do, uh, and if they don't feel like the, the institutions are strong uh, to defend them in case, you know, uh, they uh, upset powerful people, which is always the case when you do your job well in media. Correct. Then definitely, even if, even if there's no overt censorship from the organization, uh, you will self-censor. Uh, just to be on safe side, right? Uh, so, for sure, merong effect yon, um, and uh, I guess it just it remains to be seen um, what will happen in the next few years as we as this whole scenario or as this whole crisis unfolds. That's right. In your work as a journalist and also as a UN um, goodwill ambassador. How do you look at the weaponization of social media affecting our youth today? You know, using fake news, the troll armies, etc. What do you think? How does this affect the youth of today? It's. I think it's one of the biggest challenges, the biggest um, problems facing current generation. Not just the current generation, facing everyone. Uh, uh, in these in these troubled times, um, when social media first became a thing, uh, it was seen as a mainly you know a mainly a, a positive tool to bring people together, and uh, we were all very excited with the possibilities. But um, uh, that nakita rin natin na uh, ang dali pala na ma manipulate yung mga tao right. uh, by just pushing outright falsehoods and uh, it was so easy to game the system and it was so frighteningly easy to manipulate people by appealing to their emotions um, and this is not just happening in the Philippines it's happening happening all over the world um, it's happening in the U.S., it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Southeast Asia, um, in Myanmar, to, to be specific. Um, so it just makes our job doubly hard. Kasi dati, um, kahit pa paano, pag, pag, na, pag nakita mo sa TV, nabasa mo sa periodiko, hindi naman palaging tama, hindi naman palaging accurate. Uh, marami rin mga pagkakataon na mali yung naibabalita. Pero ngayon, yung impormasyon, ang pakay talaga ay mandin lang eh. Right. Uh, dahil ang daling, ang daling madala ng mga tao sa emotions nila. Uh, minsan kahit na halata namang pang naloko lang, parang kinakapitan. Dahil yun yung in yung mas nakalinya dun sa kanilang pinaniniwalaan. Yeah, I think we see a lot of those persons around with yeah, that kind of thinking. And the problem is, the problem is, it's not going to go away. We have to find a way to fight this information because, you know, we're not going to shut down social media. That's not the answer. Um, of course, there's a whole debate about how to regulate content online, which is uh, a whole different discussion um, but um, definitely on an individual level we all now have an, a responsibility that we never thought we had before and that is really 
like it's a shorthand for what we do as journalists because we are all living in the age of social media and we all have the capacity to post content we all have the, the capacity to amplify what is online um, basically we have to do the job of journalists uh, in in engaging on social media kailangan natin mag-verify ng katotohanan kailangan natin isipin kung if it's worth sharing kailangan natin maglagay ng eratum kung mali yung ating mga right. alagay uh, and I think Unfortunately, kulang pa tayo sa media literacy kasi uh, ang bilis nung mga nangyayari na parang everyone is just learning as we go along. So it's a big challenge. And it has shown a lot of division among everybody, especially among our youth. What do you think should our youth have as essential qualities in this kind of um, new normal that we have now with the proliferation of the fake news, etc. What qualities should they possess so that in their turn, they can also be peace builders? Um, I think I think empathy is definitely very important. Um, but aside from aside from empathy, you know, you uh, Siguro focusing on the challenge of disinformation, uh, being being critical uh, is all the more important nowadays. Um, you know, uh, going back to the the qualities that. Uh, have made the age of enlightenment such an important part of human history uh, going back to our reverence i guess for uh, fact-based arguments um, belief in in science for example uh, and in level health level-headed a discussion of issues but at the same time like i said dun papasok yung empathy kasi nowadays it's not enough to have the facts eh. you have to be able to understand how other people think especially those on the other side of of the aisle or the other side of the fence um many of these people aren't aren't necessarily bad, bad. Uh, they just uh they just think that uh, the solutions to the the common issues that we all feel can be found somewhere else and unfortunately uh that's a very uh attractive idea you know yung mga short yung mga quick fix yung uh, pag, parang pag reliance on on the promises of of you know of, of certain people to make things better when in fact uh Eh, hindi ganun kadali yung solution sa mga problema natin. That's right. So yeah, I guess, you know, siguro, uh, just to bring it back to the question, um, I think it's very important to have critical thinking, to to be empathetic, and I guess to also be courageous. Kasi we need a lot of courage during these times. Courage to stand up for what is right, uh, and also the courage to accept when we are not right. No? Uh, uh, the courage to to admit uh, when we have we are when we have made made a mistake. That's right. Um, also, that's also an important part of um, being good citizens. You have the privilege of actually seeing firsthand several issues affecting our country. If you are to give a message to our youth today, what would you like to say? Hmm. Um, Hmm. Um, I guess it's uh, it's again. Um, I'd like to focus on the courage part of um, this whole discussion. Um, there's so many challenges facing us right now, and the stakes are higher than ever. Uh, we've seen the resurgence of authoritarianism all over the world. Um, the pl problem of climate change isn't going away. It's getting worse. Um, 
conflicts are erupting all over the world because of precisely because of the, the climate crisis and also rising inequality. And um, unfortunately, we can't rely on the wisdom of people in power. Um, the change has to come from the ground up. And I think the youth is one of the most reliable forces when it comes to pushing for that change. Because, you know, the youth is, um, you know, they are basically on the right side. Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard to imagine the youth ever not fighting for their best interests because they, they will inherit the world. So naturally, uh, they naturally have to be involved in the issues that affect your lives at a very young age and also take that leadership position. You don't have to wait for uh, other people to fix the world for you. Uh, in fact, if you start organizing among yourselves uh, and making your voice heard, uh, the impact will be undeniable. And I think that is supported by our experience in history where young people have been in the forefront of these really big changes that happen in society. So I think just have that courage to, to uh, stand up for what is right. Um, uh, also, don't be lazy, meaning <laughs> study the world around you. Right. And um, people will follow, you know, people will follow the, le the lead of, of the youth, I think. Thank you very much for giving us time, giving us this space to talk about peace, especially your message to the youth. And I hope the message will not be lost on our youth and those who are participating in our peace conference. Our heartfelt thank you to Mr. Atom Arolio for giving us this time. It is our honor to have you in this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Alfonso Tomas Atom Araulio, for your sharing. Thank you also, Ma'am Rochelle Valencia, for facilitating the interview. We give thanks to our presenters for their sharing. At this point, let us go into a 10-minute health break. We shall resume the session in 10 minutes.
Welcome back to our fourth session for Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6. We shall now proceed to give our speakers a chance to ask questions to each other or give additional input to the talk that was just presented. We have 30 minutes for this panel discussion. Who would like to do it first? Um, mm. Attorney Alamia. Yes. Hello. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, Attorney. Thank you. Um, I think I'll answer the first uh, two questions that was asked by Mr. Primitivo uh, III, Ragandang. Um, he's asking... Uh, if I can share uh, how the Bangsamoro youth are able to advance their agenda in the BTA, especially with an adult-dominated BTA. And a follow-up question, um, you highlighted the power of social media to advance youth agenda. In your experience in the BTA, what do you think is the greatest contribution of the youth during the transition period? Well, uh, first and foremost, it's uh, provided for in the Bangsamoro Organic Law uh, that the youth is represented in the parliament. In fact, the youth has a seat in the parliament. In the coming elections also, it's, it's very clearly indicated there. In the current Bangsamoro Transition Authority, which is uh, uh, the government in transition, um, there, is a, uh, there are, I think, more than five uh, members of the, of the youth no? who are uh, members of parliament. So th that's a good... It's a good thing kasi nga karamihan sa uh, members ng parliament, especially from the uh, majority, from the MILF side, ay uh, medyo mga senior citizens na. But there are many uh, who are, um, may I think more than five are millennials. And then meron yung medyo millennial, pero sumobra na ng, ng konti. So uh, that's a good thing. Now, what has the youth been doing in, in the BARM so far uh, from the time that it, is, it was established in 2019? Well, we have seen um, at the parliament level, we passed the Bangsamoro Youth Commission law. So there is already a Bangsamoro Youth Commission, a BYC, in the BARM with its proper budget. Um, and then also, aside from that, youth organizations have also been uh, participating in the drafting of the priority codes. And these include the Bangsamoro Administrative Code, the um, Civil Service Code, Local Government Code. So all of those priority codes that are needed to uh, set up the new government and make it uh, run smoothly, uh, the youth has been participating in the consultations. They've also been doing... Um, both online and offline activities, um, for example, during the pandemic, the provision of uh, relief goods or relief uh, operations, they've been an active uh, part of the whole um, uh, humanitarian uh, provision of humanitarian aid to the people in, in the Bangsamoro. They're also involved in the um, in political party uh, organization. I, I know that a lot of them are the ones who are uh, in charge of organizing and mobilizing people on the ground, especially the youth who have just turned 18 uh, to join these political uh, parties because this is a parliamentary form of government. So the youth has, has many avenues on which they're able to get in. No? It's, it's not just in the government, but also in civil society organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Attorney Neri, do you have any additional input? We will entertain questions later sa mga participants. Uh, yeah, I, I did mention, Father, about the SK Reform Law, which is also a very useful law uh, in terms of gathering all youth organizations and providing them with platforms for participation. So um, I hope that uh, that gets... Uh, that's be given greater support in, in all our LGU efforts and have I know provide them seats also in committees such as the local school board, the health board, solid waste management board. I think it's a very powerful learning experience if the youth are given a chance to actually see how good decisions are made or how policies are made in, in a local level. And this should be augmented by um, a leadership training program that focuses on public service. 
ito, itong parang two-way interaction between actual exposure and training can really create a, a new cohort of, of local public servants. Thank you, Attorney. How about um, Mayor Mayor Tesoro? Do you have additional input? Or anyone would like to ask other presenters? If if there are no additional inputs and um, we will proceed to um, to entertain the questions from our participants. Thank you very much, presenters, for your additional inputs in the topic. For our open forum, the Zoom participants may write their questions in the chat box. For those who are participating through FB and uh, YouTube Live, you may write your questions in the comment sections. The Secretariat will keep track of your questions and will forward it to us. Please indicate to whom you want to address the question. You may ask one question, one direct, concise question, and if needed, one follow-up question. Let us examine the, the questions of our participants. Um, it is uh, addressed to anyone from Anonymous. How do you deal with false information spoused by the government itself. Attorney Neri. <laughs> Alam, um, uh, okay, Govern, coming from government itself. Um, so I think this was mentioned a lot during the panel discussions on no, digital citizenship uh, essentially uh, calls us to be more critical. We have to be critical in reading the news and also courageous as what Atom also mentioned. Courageous no, in calling out a false information. Um, I just want to share na false news, spreading false news is actually a criminal offense. It is punishable under, I think, article, I already forgot the number, but it's in the revised penal code. Very old law that punishes the spread of fake news if it endangers public order. So if it's coming from government itself, the, the person who posted it, I think, could be exposing that him or herself to criminal liability. So on our part as netizens, it is our duty to call it out. Thank you, attorney. For uh, I I will give you to our facilitator, Father Fausto James Kabungal, to facilitate some other questions from Facebook and YouTube and other questions of our participants, Father James. Yes, Father Jun Ray, we have uh, some questions still coming from our Zoom participants. From Janina Alfante, and this question is addressed to Attorney Neri. How does the anti-terrorism law or act affect the youth's social media use? Thank you, Thank you for that question, Father. There is a particular new crime created under the anti-terrorism law, which names it inciting to commit terrorism. This is a, a law that, a provision that punishes any kinds of expressions, including internet. So this is something that we should look at. No? We should be conscious about this, especially as netizens, because mere posting of what they call terroristic or inciting to terrorism might land you to a 12-year sentence. It's a 12-year uh, penalty. And any person, even without taking direct part of the crime of terrorism, can be charged with inciting to commit terrorism. Um, it, it, uh, it means you, by means of speeches, proclamations, writings, emblems, banners, or other representation tending to the same end, meaning to incite terrorism. Um, the IRR has been released already and the IRR said na before they would prosecute you for inciting to commit terrorism, they have to look into five 
uh, I think five or six standards. You have to look at your reach, who you are, the manner, the intention. And if they decide na this can be this could incite others to commit terrorism, then you can be automa- you could be arrested without a warrant. So be careful. Section nine of the anti terrorism act. Thank you, Attorney Neri. Uh, maybe Attorney Liza would like also to add. Um, hello. Well, uh, I think I don't have anything anymore to add except that um, uh, this is a reminder to the youth, especially the youth, um, to read the law on anti-terrorism and uh, including its IRR. So if it's a new law, the IRR has just been recently issued. We should all be reading that, not just lawyers. And I think youth organizations and human rights organizations should go down to the communities and uh, conduct advocacy activities, no? uh, uh, some legal consciousness activities. What, what are your rights when, for example, uh, you're about to be arrested for a crime, uh, for an alleged crime that, that, that's uh, a violation of the anti-terror law? We should do that. I think that this, this should be done. I, I've noticed that um, in Mindanao, for example, there are less organizations on the ground uh, people's organizations and human rights organizations who, who are going to the communities and teaching them about the law. I remember doing this when I was still with the civil society organization, the Bangsamoro Lawyers Network. We went to all uh, Bangsamoro communities, um, uh, especially those who have experienced human rights violations before and uh, conducted all of these uh, capacity building programs. So teaching them about the law and then at the same time teaching on uh, what to do, how, how are they going uh, to respond, what are the services that are available uh, that, they, that, that they can make use of, uh, especially services both from the government and also from civil society organizations. Thank you so much, Attorney Lisa and Attorney Neri. I think our young ones should really know before they click or post, you need to know this law. We have another question here, still from our Zoom participant, and this question is addressed addressed to Attorney Neri. With this trending call, call out culture in social media among our youth, demanding government accountability and challenging detrimental government actions. Can we say that we have enough laws to protect the Filipino youth, considering the shrinking civic spaces and with the threat of red tagging? That's a very good question, Father. No, I do think that we have sufficient remedies. We have writs, we have civil, criminal, administrative, but the question really is enforcement. Do we have the capacity to enforce them? Um, the, the, the fear, uh, uh, well, being the director of a legal aid center, no, um, we've been assisting youth or netizens who've been receiving subpoenas about their posts. And... Um, what we do is we tell them that uh, we tell them the process. We tell them what are the options, and at least to give them peace of mind. But what does this say? It it does say that there is this uh, sort of trend, no, of weaponizing the law, and uh, it's encapsulated in the question. There's red tagging, and then there is this sort of using processes to intimidate people, right? So how do we counter that? I think we have to continue to be courageous. I mean, there's no other way because the, the whole intention, I think, is to silence us, no? to silence us, to, to give a chilling effect. And if we really be chilled or mahalukta or we get scared and just deactivate, then I think the forces of darkness will win. So we have to be courageous. And I think, how do we do that? Um, repeatedly in this conference, we've been talking about the importance of com- building community of solidarity. Of, of empathy, no? support a uh, network of lawyers or paralegals or, or youth leaders that gives uh, support to one another. And I think, as what uh, attorney also said, Lisa said, we have to increase rights awareness. No? How do they, you know, do they, they know if they're liable, where, they go, what, where will they go, how to preserve evidence? I think basic, uh, no, basic knowledge that everybody, every citizen should have. Okay, thank you, Attorney Neri. I will not ask uh, Attorney Lisa about if he, she wants to add or not, because 
there's another question and this is addressed to her. Attorney Liza? Yes. Still coming uh, from Claudine Adrales, our Zoom participant. You mentioned about the youth's participation in the BARMM parliamentary elections. How does this work in relation to the national elections? Um, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, apologies, I turned off my video. It's uh, uh, we have a problem. You no, know, the band, it's occupying a lot of the bandwidth. Okay, so how can the youth? Uh, how how do, how does this work in relation to the national elections? Just to uh, give the context, under the Bangsamoro Organic Law, there is supposed to be an election in 2022. And um, the BARM government is a new form of government. It's a parliamentary form of government um, where the parliament or the legislative branch is fused with the executive branch. So you have 80 members of parliament who uh, will be elected. Um, half of that would come from political parties. And, and so uh, the youth can participate, no? they, they can form a political party, they can join, for example, a big political party and become the youth wing of that political party and run for elections by 2022. How does this work in relation to the national elections? Um, well, under the law, and under the constitution, we have a uh, presidential form of government. Uh, the elections would continue. There are other laws that also provide that the youth, uh, where the youth can participate. For example, as already said by Attorney Neri earlier, the youth can have seats, for example, in the Sangunian, in the legislative branch of the local of the local government unit. So there, if, if you are into politics, if you would, if you feel that you're able to help uh, more by joining politics, by becoming politically active, then I think that's that's one of the entry points for you. You can join uh, the parliament in, in the barn if you come from the Bank Samoro, or you can join the local government units, uh, aside from all the uh, suggestions that were provided earlier. Thank you, Attorney Liza. Uh, we will just proceed to our next question. Our participant chose to be anonymous. And the question is, when people like me choose not to take sides and are not vocal about our opinions, does it mean that we are toxic? Other netizens try to shame people for not being vocal in social media. The reason we don't engage much in social media is that no matter what side we take, we will anger a certain individual. What is your take regarding this issue? Uh, this is addressed to all the speakers. Uh, we'll go first. I think uh, Attorney Neri can uh, go first. This is, this is inter interesting because I can relate. No, parang I have this experience. Na I, I, I actually uh, fought somebody online. <laughs> uh, but we don't know each other. But we we kind of spot over our status and it became intense. And like months after, in this conference, I was surprised that he, that he was my seatmate. <laughs> And then we were able to discuss, um, and we were very cordial and civil. My, my point there is sometimes in social media, it's very easy to be toxic because there is no physical um, presence. You know, you can, you can fight through your words, all caps with emojis, and the communication will, will, will deteriorate because there's no body communication. So my suggestion here is if you feel that it's toxic, go ahead. You know, you have all the right to, to disengage. Naman, no? But please... Um, also exert the effort to communicate to people with different views in a face-to-face -face setting. I mean, it's a good way uh, schools can actually facilitate um, conversations with uh, people with different views. No, And I think this is very healthy in, in creating a more critical uh, community. Right? So, but uh, when you, example, when you're very strong sa imong position online, and then you will be you will be labeled as toxic. You know, don't be um, don't be persuaded, don't be affected because you are standing up for the what you believe in, right? And if you see uh, social media as a platform for you to communicate that, then go ahead, go ahead. Um, but you know that's the cost, so you have to firm up yourself and expect that people will really may call out or maybe troll you but that's part of the, the contract kumbaga. thank you father 
Thank you, Attorney. Attorney Liza? Yes, uh, this is a, a very good question. And I think this is being experienced by a lot of us, uh, si Attorney Neri, uh, almost everyone. Um, if I, I advise the youth to watch this uh, documentary in, in, uh, at Netflix I, uh, about social media, about Facebook, um, and also uh, the power, uh, what happened to uh, this guy who, who got out of the, N the National Security Agency of the United States, Snowden. So just to understand no, the, the context of uh, the platforms that we have right at the tip of our fingertips uh, right now. Now, my advice would be, um, because you, you will always be labeled, and I noticed, we have noticed this, there is a study that has been conducted on this, that the world is now more polarized than ever. Everyone is at extremes because of social media. But take note, social media is just a tool. It is just a tool. So it's being utilized by people with different interests, with different agenda. So if there is a if there is a political agenda, they're using that tool. There are trolls, for example. Uh, there are uh, those who would um, uh, provide, you know, they would spread fake news, for example. Um, ako ang, ang king ko dito. If if you think that it is very toxic already, then get out. Get out of social media. Uh, magpahinga muna, rest, and then uh, you can go back. But the other, the other um, advice that I could, I could, I can give is a similar advice, a uh, similar tactic that I'm using in the parliament. It's similar in Congress or in the Senate. Uh, there is a tendency for um, people with very strong convictions to argue and and uh, be very uh, toxic, no? Even in the parliament, even in legislative uh, legislative making, and 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 um, when that happens, you should be able to control yourself and manage your anger. It's also the same. You should be able to also manage the hurt, the pain that you feel when the other side would oppose you. In social media, it's more painful because there's no filter. So the best thing to do is that uh, you ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it uh, for me, for my family, if I'm going to engage this very toxic person on social media na hindi ko naman kilala, um, who's, who's either saying na DDS ako or dilawan ako. No, it's, it's always the two sides of the coin na parabang the world is, uh, 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 the world is divided into uh, DDS and Dilawan or Republicans and, and uh, what's this, Democrats. So we should be the ones who are responsible enough to know uh, when uh, we have to stop. No? Kailan natin uh, ititigil yung... Uh... Attorney Terry, uh, Liza, nakamute po. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, po. okay. Continue po. Yes, so we should, we, it's ourselves, no? Tayo mismo dapat ang mag-manage non, ang mag-control non. And, they, uh, and uh, just be zen about it. Be, be chill about it, no? Talagang toxic talaga sa social media. So um, I would advise, uh, get out of social media, go out into the real world, talk to real people, talk to your neighbor, do gardening, uh, have, play with your pets. So wag, wag ubusin ang time the whole day na nandyan uh, sa social media. You cannot change the world. You cannot change the behavior uh, of other people, no? especially kung isang tao lang yun na uh, very toxic. So uh, go do something else and, and try to realize na Meron pang ibang pwedeng pag-aksayahan ng, ng panahon. If you want to change something, change the mindsets of people, there are other uh, methods of doing that, not, not, just by, uh, not just through social media or arguing in social media. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Liza and Attorney. Those are very good advices relevant to our young ones, young leaders, when not to and when to engage in social media. We'll proceed to our next question from a religious organization, Bukal ng Tipan, CICM. And this is addressed to Attorney Neri, but Attorney Liza can also add later. What would be your recommendations for faith 
based institutions in facilitating youth leadership and participation in concrete social transformation? That's a good question, Father. No? Um, sometimes I always tell mga youth development program officers, and I think it's important that you emphasize to the youth the distinction between two virtues, charity and justice. When we're talking about religio, uh, religious organizations, we talk about the values that we espouse, and then we often talk about charity and justice. I think it's these two are very important um, virtues, but but uh, let's try to highlight na these two values are, are used in different contexts. If there is a need for immediate relief, then let's teach our youth leaders to build a culture of charity. Organizing the community, develop, making a kitchen, anang mga community kitchens, giving soup, relief, that's an exercise of charity. But I think in the long term, we, the religious movements ministers, should also talk about not just charity, but justice. Teaching the youth the skill in asking very hard questions. Why are there poor people? Bakit marami ang gutom? Ngano mahal ang balay, ang yuta? And why wala ni sila yuta? You know? um, when they begin to ask these very hard questions, um, then they begin to see that there is a structure, that, that uh, a violent structure that was embedded for many, many centuries. And they could see how, how they will, well, in their own way, dismantle it, right? Through their social advocacy and activism in peaceful ways. And that is a conversation on justice. So I think, yeah, we have to make a distinction. Charity is good for immediate concerns, but in the long term, we have to teach the youth the works of justice. Thank you, attorney. Attorney Liza, would you like to add what's your insight? Thank you. Uh, that's very beautiful, Attorney Neri, uh, Charity and Justice. I would like to add to that, and I think it's because of the uh, Ateneo education that, that I have gone through. Um, I, I believe in the word magis uh, or, or doing more. Huh? Um, it's, I, I, it's something that I can advise for faith-based institutions, especially the youth who are involved in in faith-based organizations um, to do to do more to be to be better. So um, kasama papasok na doon yung justice at yung charity and I think a very important uh, quality na kailangan nating pagtunan ng pansin ay yung compassion. Um, it's it's uh, uh, trying to know now walking under the skin of somebody else to understand what what he is going through. Um, it's something that would help uh, people not get into a fight, not to be polarized too much. No? Yung, yung intindihin natin, baka kailangang intindihin uh, bakit siya ganyan. You, you really have to walk under his skin and try to understand. No? It's, it's, it's about compassion. And, and you're doing that because it, it becomes a, uh, a moral responsibility for you. No? It's, it's part of your faith. Uh, whether Catholic, uh, any other sect, uh, Christianity, or or Muslim, it's just the same. These values are the same. The the value of uh, doing more for others, being kind and and honesty and being compassionate, uh, plus plus justice, of course, uh, in 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 the way that we treat other people. Sa lahat ng ating ginagawa, then I think that that would help, no, sa sa social transformation. Uh, ng ating mga communities. Thank you for that additional input, Attorney Liza. Now we go to our next question from Jeffrey Karin, still a, a Zoom participant. And this address to Attorney Neri. Attorney how did you spark the creation of the OYDC, the Auto Youth Development Council? Ah, okay, that's a good question. Because um, the, the Auto Youth existed before the SK Reform Law. And we started out as a small group of youth volunteers who conducted voters' ed in, during the 2013 uh, election. And then we realized that it's not enough to teach youth how to vote. 
it's not even enough to tell them who to vote for. Like, ano yung mga criteria, di ba? Honest, etc. We realize that we have to make it a point that democracy is not just about election. It is about how we participate in the daily work of governance and democracy building. And we thought of, why not create a council na wala, kasi wala, wala SK ato na time because of the suspension. This youth council will serve as the repository of youth participant, uh, youth orgs across the city where they can participate in the in the different committees of the city. And that's where it started. We lobbied it um, with the mayor. The mayor agreed. They, he gave us the ability to draft our own executive order. And we were very proud of it. No, we started in 2014 to an EO. Then in 2018, as we build our social and political capital, we were then able to push for the codification of the youth code, which officially created the Oro Youth Development Office with a team of seven regular city employees with a budget of around seven million, I think. And then uh, they are now institutionalized, right? So a movement from a mere voters ed movement, it became a city institution and we're very proud of it. We're very, very, very happy that we were able to, to succeed in translating the movement into an actual ordinance. So that's the whole story of the Oro, Oro Youth. Thank you, Attorney Neri. Hope that answers the question of uh, Sir Jeffrey Karim. Our next question, uh, this is intended for, for both the speakers. As a student leader, as student leaders, how do we influence our constituents to be more socially aware, especially if we have this culture of apathy? I think Attorney Liza can uh, go ahead first. Yes, um, that's that's really very sad, no? If uh, I, I have also seen that, but I noticed that this um, apathy that that uh, we normally see, we see that sa mga universities, sa mga schools and colleges, habang nandyan pa sila, uh, konti lang yung nag-join sa mga organizations, na mga uh, for social transformation, for example. Um, konti lang. I think because ang um, priorities nila uh, at that time when I was still a, a student activist, I was thinking na baka talagang priority nila talaga yung kanilang uh, pag-aaral. That's why they're not joining. Uh, but I've noticed now because of, again social media on Twitter for example, mas maraming kabataan now who are involved and and they they're using this platform especially in the philippines they they're using the twitter to be able to espouse yung uh, lahat ng mga advocacies that uh, that they are um, trying to uh, get across no uh, their own communities and and in the whole in the whole country ako ang tingin ko um baka kailangan pa ng uh, in the schools in the universities and in the colleges I think that kahit na hindi siya Catholic school, hindi siya uh, faith-based organization, and yata yung uh, merong parang uh, formation program for uh, students, for, for the youth, uh, with respect to um, uh, becoming socially aware. How do you make them socially aware? I just like to uh, bring the discussion to, for example, uh, the value of cura personalis, which which means uh, care for the individual person. It's it's respecting each person as a child of God and all of God's creation. So lahat pati insects, pati animals. So kahit nang sama na ng ugali ng ng kausap mo, nung kinakaaway mo, but if if you have this uh, value of cura personalis and you care for the individual. Wala kang gagawing hakbang that's going to hurt the other individual. And in fact, it's going to help, in fact, change that person kung makikita niya na hindi ka pala, hindi ka ganon, hindi mo siya papatulan. So I think some of these values that, that I have been mentioning, being men and women for others, kapag i-instill yan in the schools, mula pa pagkabata hanggang sa mag-graduate na, nakikita nila yan, merong uh, parang transform, uh, merong formation, no? sessions na ginagawa uh, sa mga sudyante, sa mga bata. 
um, that would help lalabas yan when when they become uh, leaders when they go out into the world they're going to remember all of these values when they uh, encounter for example they they uh, have a job in the government and they see corruption they will go they will remember they will look back and remember what they've learned uh, in the universities in the schools and and say okay anong gagawin ko what am i going to do am i going to be the influencer no yung sinasabi kanina ni attorney Neri. am i going to be the enabler or will i be the uh, bridging leader and and bridge this what's happening here no bridge the values that i have learned into this organization that I am in, into this agency that I am in, to change the agency. It's very difficult. Uh, I've worked in the government for several years. It's, it's very difficult, but actually it can be done. Just um, uh, maintain, no? just stand pat on your principles. Huwag kang pumayag na palitan mo yung principles na yon, no? uh, But it's very difficult, I know, pero kaya po siya. Kakayanin po yan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Alamia. It has been worthwhile listening to the exchange of ideas. Father, Father uh, Jure, I think uh, uh, Attorney Neri has still has something to say. Sorry for that. Hey, it's okay. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah. That's really a question, no? So, mga, even youth, the, the student leaders and youth leaders, how do you promote social formation awareness in the society ng Muragdagan kay ap apathetic, no? Ay, very good to ang immersion na uh, component. But also think about creative ways in going into the, going where the students are. Like, you know, you could always be creative by promoting social concerns through TikTok or Instagram or Facebook through the use of social media itself because that's where most of the students are. So I think youth leaders should be strategic in, in developing their or packaging their communication plan. Uh, my point lang is go where they are. You can make it popular. Um, social issues can be packaged in a more top appealing way and we can just Google it and there's so many ideas about it. In lang father. Thank you, Attorney Neri. Uh, I'll give you back uh, to our moderator, Father Junre Aguilion. Before we end the session, we may request our speakers for their closing messages. Sino yung mauna? Attorney, uh, Attorney Alamia, there you go. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to open my video, but the, the internet really is uh, is choppy. As, as a parting message, uh, which I wasn't able to uh, discuss, um, uh, for the youth, no? um, I advise, uh, I recommend that uh, even if you finish going to school, I recommend continuing education, continuing learning. Uh, no matter, it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you are 50 or 60 years old, you should continue to learn. And um, I think we should look at, uh, if you're going to be the future leaders of this country, the future leaders of the Bangsamoro, of the regions, the different local government units in Mindanao, for example, please take note of uh, servant leadership um, that's that's very, very uh, close to my heart. Um, and try to remember the 11 pillars of servant leadership, which I've been trying to imbibe and uh, practice in, in my own uh, work and in my own life. And, and these are uh, calling, the, the, the capacity to listen, uh, empathy or compassion, healing also, awareness, persuasion, uh, the capacity to have foresight, which is very important for a leader, um, conceptualization, st stewardship, growth, and community. So um, I have high hopes for the youth. Uh, I hope that uh, you're going to be really, you know, the, it's, it's always, when, when I was young, they, they told me um, I'm the future of the country. And, and then now we're telling the, the youth that you are the future of the country. Yes, because we might not see 
all of the changes that we want to see in, in our lifetimes. That's why um, there is a responsibility to hand down no? to the next generation the responsibility of taking care of the world. So I have high hopes in you. Uh, good luck. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, ma'am. Attorney, attorney Nelly. Um, to the youth, to the youth no, um, our challenge now is the world is so noisy. It's so loud. We don't know who we are because our identity or value is sometimes pegged on the number of likes we have or the number of reacts we have on social media. And that's a problem. So my message here is we have to be discerning. We have to try to go back to ourselves and ask who are we really? What are our values? What do we value? What is our worth? And that requires a sense of silence, I think, and a sense of reflection. And the schools and our mentors should be able to also give opportunities for the youth to think about these very important things. Because once, I guess, once we at least clarify our values, who we are, what we want to achieve for ourselves and our society, it frees you as a person, right? It, it liberates you and makes you fuller and makes you more courageous, makes you more you know, active in, 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 in just sharing uh, yourself to the world through, through the service that you give. And I think that's the whole foundation of, of, of leadership. We have to clarify and go back to what we value. Thank you, Attorney Neri. Those are great, brilliant takes away for this session. In, in summary, in this session, in, the, in this fourth session, Attorney Ernesto Neri spoke about the three challenges brought by the pandemic, widening gaps, shrinking civic spaces, mental distress, and he also spoke about the three roles of the youth, enablers, power checkers, frontliners. These three roles call for accountability, engage policy makers, and help deliver public services. How to attain this? We must build a community of solidarity, develop bridging youth leaders, integrate digital leadership. And lastly, Attorney Neri reminds us to treat the youth from the client to citizens, change their mindset as such, and build them a platform to participate. And according to Attorney Liza Alamia, she said, yesterday's magic is today's reality. The pandemic compounds all the problems. This time demands leadership among the youth. This generation has more access to technology and information. She said social media is a tool to help the youth to be of great help in the society and for self-development. He added to do, we must do more matches for the betterment of the society and the community where we belong. And according to Mayor Donya Crescentia Tesoro, he mentions some points to remember. First, no matter how differences, we are all interconnected as one nation. Millennial leaders value the opinion of the people they work with, but there should always be checks and balances. It would be great if young leaders are result-oriented. She added, preparedness and early detection are important in times of pandemic. And according to Atom Araulio, the role of media, social media, is more important now when there is a proliferation of fake news. In these troubled times, one of the biggest challenges is the weaponization of the social media. He mentioned also empathy is important for the youth to possess during this time. Being critical, have courage to stand up for what is right and have courage to admit when one is mistaken. To all, 
you are the youth around you the to all the youth who are here in our um fourth session you are the future of our country once again we would like to express our gratitude to our four speakers and please allow me to read the certificate of appreciation for them the text reads Father Saturnino Orius University, in partnership with Deutsche Gesellschafer Internationale, Susamin Arbeit, or GIZ, presents this certificate of appreciation to Attorney Liza Masuhud Alamia, to Attorney Ernesto Bineri, to Honorable Dunya Crescencia Reyes de Soro, and also for Ms. to Mr. Alfonso. Tomas Atom Araulio for the invaluable service and contribution as presenter in the webinar ses session in on youth leadership and social media in context of COVID-19 during the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6 with the theme, Peace for Mindanao in the New Normal. Given this 24th day of November 2020, at the Father Saturnino Orius University, Butuan City, Philippines. Signed, Goni Suitalia Roof, Principal Advisor, UCAP of Deutsche Gesellschaft for International Examen Arbeit, or GIZ. Signed by Reverend Father Randy Jasper Ochigi, SDHD, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Research, Father Saturnino Orius University. A, signed by Reverend Father John Christian Young, SDHD, President, Father Saturnino, Orius University. The soft copy of the certificate will be mailed to you soonest. Thank you very much. Let me turn you over to our facilitator, Father Fausto James Kabungkal, for the evaluation link and some announcements. Thank you, Father Junre Aguilion, for moderating our session this afternoon. Thank you also to our speakers, Attorney Liza, Attorney Ernesto, Honorable Doña Crescencia, and for Mr. Alfonso Atom Aralio for the interview. They, before we end our session, we would like to invite everyone to watch the next sessions of the conference tomorrow. There will be one in the morning with the theme, Continuing Health Challenges, new conflict lines, social dynamics of the new normal. And another in the afternoon with a team, peace education, digital divide during the time of COVID-19. To all our participants to receive your certificate of participation, please answer the evaluation through the QR code or link shared in the chat box and in the comment section for the FB Live and YouTube participants. The QR code or link will also be shown on the screen, as you can see. That ends our fourth session of the Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6. We would like to acknowledge the lead partners of Mindanao Peace Studies Conference 6, Father Saturnino Urius University, and Deutsche Gesellschaft Internationale Zusammen Arbeit, or GIZ. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation. We hope to see you in the other sessions of this conference. This has been Father Fausto James Kabungkal, your facilitator from FSUU. Good afternoon and God bless everyone. <laughs>